name is Kay Cook. I'm from the Department of Social Sciences at Swinburne University of Technology. And I'm speaking today with Therese Edwards, the CEO of the National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. Welcome, Therese. Thank you, Kay. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And I'd like to talk to you today about how COVID-19 has impacted on single mothers and their children. If you could tell us a bit about how that has played out in the community you work with. So COVID-19 has had a really significant impact on single mums and on various layers. So first of all, heading into COVID-19, we knew that there was already um, inequality and economic hardship experienced by single mothers. And so there was not that extra sort of, um, I suppose, savings that could assist to protect whether it was through buying up the required um, protective items, just like the extra hand sanitizer, the, the household cleaning products, or whether it was to get those extra scripts, there was fear about um, um, Ventolin, all sorts of medication, as well as just, um, just trying to get those extra needs for the call to respond to homeschool. So there was that financial concern, but also for single mums, um, if, if they were in the paid workforce and they cobbled together that extra money to, to keep the household budget floating, they actually had to retreat from that because they then had the role of doing the homeschooling. So there was not that extra set of hands and um, to share that, that load, that, that home load. And then lots of single mums who were either in receipt of disability support pension or carers, they retreated to, um, to their home before it became, I suppose, state or national policy because they were very aware of a compromised immune system. So there was lots of levels of concern in, in that space. And it was so the, the emotional load, the, the energy, the capacity was really put on display because of COVID-19. And how has the government been providing support to single mothers during COVID-19? So I, I can describe my position as really straddling contrast. So one of the um, very decisive and quick actions that the government did was to bring in the coronavirus supplement, which increased some of our lowest recipients in the income support by an extra $550 per fortnight. And so for a, and what that means for a single mum whose child was older than eight, her income support sat around $620. All of a sudden, it went up to eleven hundred dollars a fortnight. So, for we were seeing amazing, powerful, profound changes in that household, and it happened. It, the, I started to get it very organically. So, I was getting texts, messages from women who had been in and out of our our service for um, for some time, who were sending me pictures. So the first picture that came through was a mum buying for the first time in many years a pair of winter pyjamas, brand new, and she emphasised that they were brand new. Then I was getting pictures of um, mums that had full shopping baskets and in that shopping basket it wasn't the, the usual standard sort of cheaper white bread. There was wholemeal bread, but most importantly there was fresh fruit and vegetables, and that seemed to be a big, big change. And so we started to see what, what could happen if our safety net worked in a way that it was meant to work. So some of the most amazing things were happening. So um, women for a moment stepping away from housing stress, their, their health was improving because they were filling their scripts. They weren't skipping um, meals as a way of managing the budget. Um, children's health care was enabled. So those extra things, um, when a hydrotherapy, 
all these extra bits and bobs that are just out of reach of a really tight budget were starting to happen. And one of the big ones that was coming through was dental care. So the women were talking about being able to get to the dentist or getting their children to a dentist and entering into um, an arrangement where the dental work was going to happen and they could enter into a plan. And it was so significant and so recurring that I actually wrote to the um, Australian Dental Association because I was convinced that, that they would be seeing that as well. So we had this pocket of such positive and profound changes in our, in our household. So we had for the first time for a long time we didn't have to imagine what could happen. We had evidence of what could happen when there was enough money for people to just make those basics and essentials. And then after that started to occur, the next step was that work ready step. So we were, I was getting um, stories of study, buying what is needed for, for courses, um, getting the car fixed because the car is a big part of maintaining a job now and then um, work ready clothes so there was a real sense of optimism about capacity to plan there was emotional space for families to take stock of their circumstances and to actually start to plan for the future and what has the national council of single mothers been doing in response to this now that we're sort of transitioning towards and there's talk about when things change when we go to a post-COVID sort of welfare arrangements. We need to get this message out. We need to share what can happen to families. It has transformed families, this supplement. And on the other hand, where families missed out, we have seen that they have struggled and have been the main required, they, they mostly required that emergency relief. So we really need to advocate at every possible level to ensure that the coronavirus supplement or something to that effect is maintained. So there's a, there was a few strategies around that. So first of all, building upon um, what I was witnessing, what I had the privilege to witness, I set up the 550 Reasons to Smile campaign, which was really a, a Facebook page. And it had, um, a, it had some really clear aims. So the first aim was to give space and platform and voice to people who are living in hardship that are often some of the most amazing money managers but what they did or could do if they had access to additional and critical resources. So that was one of the aims. The second thing was to build awareness to the community about how tough people were doing it before COVID-19. And, and that, that is as a, as a public platform, I've had members, uh, mostly other women talking about that they have never thought for one moment that women could not go and buy new underwear, that they could not have enough food to eat, that we were in this rich, lucky country that that would not happen in Australia. So we're building that community awareness. We also provided a space for the media to go and read the stories firsthand, not scripted, could see the pictures, could actually get involved. And it, it really struck a chord. And, we're, and I think I'm up to about the fourth or fifth media outlet that has contacted me directly through that, um, that platform. And then, of course, it, it provides that, that space for us to actually give real hard, quantitative information to the government and just say, hey, look, this is what's happening. So you talk there about being able to provide evidence to the government of the 
the positive changes that can be made when people have enough money to meet their basic needs and also the security that that money is not going to evaporate in a week's time or two weeks time. What types of evidence are you trying to compile or that do you find useful in when trying to make a case to government to affect more humanistic policies? Sure. So one, uh, what we can do as the National Council of Single Mothers and the Children and connected with women is that we can actually bring the voice, the lived experience. What we don't do and what we would like to is to bring that rigour of research um, and facts, facts to the table. So it, we'd like to be able to talk about that it is a gendered issue that it has been entrenched a gendered issue, that low incomes are experienced by, by women. So we know it intuitively just because of the amount of people that we talk to, we know it because there is enough evidence out there, but we will never be able to have that research capacity to complement that lived reality and to, to mount a really strong, persuasive argument, you need both, both of those elements. We worked together on a piece of research recently about uh, the impacts and the experience of women accessing the child support system, which ties into a lot of these issues around uh, both low-income women's incomes, but also their ex-partners' incomes. And I'm assuming that that has been impacted by COVID-19 as well. Yeah, so child support um, has been, for, for people who are affected by COVID-19, child support is quite central to, to their thinking, to the way that they're managing their, their households. So um, we know that that child support in some houses have been reduced because the ex-partner's income has been reduced. Um, we also know that there was a significant child support debt. The recorded one was 1.6 billion pre-COVID. And we've, we've, I've, I've been fielding questions from women when they read about access to superannuation and I know that under COVID that the rules have changed that there is some hardship and there is um accessing some amount so one of the 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 generalist questions that I get asked a lot is so he's got a debt he has superannuation we're in hardship can we access his superannuation and you would think that you could say yes of course, he, it should be one of the first priorities or, or is to pay off your debt and particularly pay off your child support debt. It is under legislation that, that families have a responsibility to financial care for their children within their capacity. And having that amount in your superannuation demonstrates that it's within your capacity. But unfortunately, that has not been... Um, a recommendation take, taken up by the government. And so one of my concerns has been with, with child support through COVID, I've described it as a significant and major national policy that has gone missing in action. And so there again, Kay, that's where the work of, of Swinburne and other academics who actually talk about child support as a significant policy, what it means in terms of size, breadth and reach, as well as capacity, is really important to help persuade and make that case. What do you hope that the government will do next in terms of supporting single mothers and their children? I want to say halt to the snap back because we know that snap back won't work for um for women straight up secondly if they have care capacity and they are the, if they have care responsibilities and they are the sole provider they will have further capacity 
uh, further reduce capacity, and then if they're affected by family and domestic violence, it then even puts them further behind the baseline. So the proposed and scheduled cuts to reduce the coronavirus on the 25th of September makes no sense. We're not out of this. And I don't need to tell anyone who works at Swinburne in, in Melbourne that we are so not out of this. So we need to put that on hold and we need to make sure that we have a safety net and income support system that will support mums and children and that that remains until there is a high level and in-depth research of what are the amounts that people need to access just to make their household operate. And um, so that's, that's the most and critical important message at the moment. We know that we have one million children who are in households that are in receipt of that coronavirus supplement. And we're saying, don't do anything until there is something to replace that because you're talking to a group of people who every crisis we've gone through whether it was the global financial crisis or whether it's this one we know that they are hard hit and they they don't snap back they take a long time to recover finally what would justice for single mothers and their children look like in the current corona era or in the post corona era i think dignity and respect comes to mind um we don't value care we've never valued it we expect women to work as if they don't have children and then we expect them to parent as if they don't have work we've got a really mixed and unusual way of um respecting the great importance task of raising children. And so what we do is we make it so hard for the parent who is stepping up and doing the hard work. And we seem to put a lot of loopholes in for the person who can choose, make a lot of decisions regarding how much access they do, how much support they provide, um, whether they can move away or not move away. So we really need to revisit what we expect of women and we need to really respect the role of parenting. And rather than making it harder, let's make it easier. Thank you very much, Therese, for the important insights and all the best with the work that the National Council on Single Mothers and Their Children are doing at this tough time. You're welcome, Kay. Thanks for asking our voice and thanks for being a really solid research and, uh, um, and all the publications and the journals that come out of Swinburne. Greatly appreciated. Thanks, Therese.